May 26, 1924, when the war started in 1941, anybody that was going to be drafted could finish school. So in June 1942, I graduated from the Southern High School, which was Lucille Ball School also. Okay. And then that going to the machine shop in Jamestown, that was after school. They let me out a half an hour early so I could get down there by three o'clock. And I did that for six weeks. And when I graduated, then I said that before my brother and I went to Cataraugus where my uncle lived to go to Buffalo. The plant that produces more United States Army planes than any other, busy turning them out. Buffalo, New York. Next day, in an interview for Curtis Wright, was so hot and I was so green of being in the city that I sit in that building from when we got there until way afternoon and when I got up to interview I passed out. Oh my God. <laughs> it was so hot. But I got the job anyway. The graveyard shift that Curtis right from eight, seven, or 11 to 7. Worked there and then I got my draft card. I came 4F for the duration you'll be working here. Well, time went on. The first part of January, 43, all of a sudden I got this notice from the draft board, a report immediately, now. And that was in Mayville, by the way. So I had to go get a bus, I rode back to Jamestown. My mother and I got on the bus, went to the boat landing, got on the railroad, the WR, went to Mayville, walked up, and what had happened, my father, he got drafted. Your father? My father. We have the same name. Yeah. So when he went up, the guy looked at him and said, you're not 18. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, that's when I went into the Army. Uh, was a 19th, I think, and he said, and, and then one week you got to go clear your courses up. So I went out, got back on the streetcar, went back to Jamestown, went home, got my stuff, went back, got the bus to Buffalo, went to work that night, <laughs> and gave my notice for a week, and went to Mayville on the worst blizzard in a hundred years, I think. And we got up there, and we all that had to be inspected, and we raised it, our hand, you know, was sworn into the Army again, and then we were put on a train, and we were going south, we knew that, and when we were on the train going, I was sitting in the car, and I heard some of voice, and, I, hey, and there was my uncle Biff Bothered. He was a conductor on that train, and he worked on the railroad for 50 years or more. And so we had a good chat and we ended up in Florida with all of our winter clothes on. And we got there, I know it was early in the morning, we had to stand outside the tracks and wait and wait and wait. And we finally got into the Miami Beach hotels had been turned into barracks. And that's where we did our, some basic training, but basically it was finding out what you could do. You had interviews and all this thing, and you had your uh, big card, and there was punches in it, you know, all the way around, and that followed you all the way through the Army. Sitting there, and I was the last one to be interviewed before noon. All of a sudden, all of the guys in there, it's noon, let's go to lunch. Well, I was sitting there alone. I wasn't going to sit there, so I stood up to the last guy ran in. I said, wait a minute, don't go. I want to know what I'm going to do. He said, what do you want? I said, I want to be in the Air Corps. Okay, you're in the Air Corps. And out he ran. <laughs> in a day or two, I shipped out to Denver, Colorado, to the Army or Air Corps training, the school there. And it was a photo school that I went to six days a week learning that how to develop how to take photographs and basically 
they said we were photo lab technicians, but what we were training for was map reading. These uh, photo lab technicians were shipped out and they told us they are the ones that are killed the most because they would set up these um, little huts to develop the maps in that the reconnaissance planes would take over the German, uh, see where the troops were and all that. And those maps were all put together first. Then you had a thing you looked at and it made 3D. Mm. So if there was a supposed to be a bombing of the railroad station here, you could see it before then after you could look at it when the new reconnaissance planes came in to see if they had hit it or what was going on in troop movement. And because there was too many of us, they had to split us up. So I was sent from there to Oklahoma City and from Oklahoma City up to Liberal Army Airfield, Liberal, Kansas. In the fall, they found out I had a rupture, so they sent me to the hospital in it was Winter General Hospital, and I had that taken, and I couldn't work for a while, and they put me in the office. Uh, because I, out of all them 200 or whatever it was in our outfit, I could only, there was only one that could type, and that was me. <laughs> he came through our base one day, and we stood from almost dawn until, um, night. yeah, that was when I was at Denver. We had to get out, and he was going to drive through, and that's all it was. <laughs> right through. So you saw the president but it was just a walk drive-by. Yes that's all it was. The bulge came mm -hmm. and everybody who was not especially essential was pulled out and sent to training and I think my first training was in Virginia and everybody was there and I had made sergeant by then and I had, we had some basic training, you know, when we were in Florida and like that, but not much on the rifle range and building the airport there. Uh, you wouldn't do much of that, but it still had to march and you had, you know, some of that, but now it was earnest. In a week or two, I'm going to have people shooting at me. I better learn something. <laughs> and there was a guy that was regular army and we would go out, it didn't matter what the weather was, you had your training, your shooting and target and all that, so I got lashed on to him and I made him teach me everything he knew. And then after that, we got transferred down to Louisiana, living uh, way back in the hills, there was camps all around. And because I was a sergeant, charge of one third of 250 men in our outfit. And we had to learn the rifle, the carbine, mortar, bazooka, machine guns, water-cooled, air-cooled, and grenades training down there and had to crawl on the ground with the machine guns, you know, really shooting over you. Jeep come bar barreling from headquarters in there, stood up and said, Sergeant Stormer, front and center, yeah, well get in, you got to go back to the base. This was a, like the night before my outfit was shipping out to Europe, to right. Germany. And I thought something bad had happened at home. So they put me in the holding center. Was there, waited, waited, nothing. I'd ask each day, nothing, nothing, nothing. So it was raining, pouring down there in the headquarters where all our records were kept. I had a raincoat with no insignia on it, and I had my cap with a insignia here, you know, and I put a plastic thing over to keep it right. And that Sunday I walked down into that office, and it was busy, and on each side of a room, maybe long, there was banks and your, uh, records that followed you were folded about this big like a business envelope was about the size of them thousands of them and all of these you know and i walked in and i said uh, i'm here to check on a sergeant john stormer <laughs> he you know what's he doing and 
I think he's in holy and I want to find out exactly what his status is. Just like I was an officer. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> oh, okay. They didn't never question, you know, okay. So they looked and they finally looked and looked and looked and looked finally. He said, oh, here's the slot and here's the slot. He, oh, he was supposed to be in this slot. He shipped out. Then, no, he didn't. Oh, then they looked at, oh, somebody accidentally put it here. That's the only thing that kept me from going overseas. Oh my gosh. And I think, I, I, I always felt, felt, I don't know if I felt bad or lucky or what, but I think my outfit got almost wiped out. It started me training all over again, or I became training again, another outfit, okay? And this was more brutal than what, because we were now training to go to Japan. If the war was over, it would be either way we could go. It is a Saturday, next day, Sunday, Monday, we were packing up the ship. Okay, but we had a smart, I used, well, an officer, he decided we should take one last big jungle, you know, training. And we went through the uh, swamps down there, water up to here, brush that we had to use our machetes to cut to get through. And when we came out, we were wet, tired and everything. So then you're back, you know, you clean up. And Sunday morning, I got up. And right on my face right here was a little bit of rash. God, that is really, really you know, itchy. Monday morning when I got up, I was broken out, my arms, my eyes were closed. It was a severe case of poison ivy. Oh my God. Ah, and that heat down there, and I was always really allergic to poison ivy from the time I was a kid. Never thought going through there that would be and the gist of it was I went on sick call and spent almost two weeks in the hospital getting over that. When I got out, guess what? We started trading another group. <laughs> My Lord. We're interrupting programs to make the following announcement. It is understood that in accordance with arrangements between the three great powers, an official announcement will be broadcast by the Prime Minister at three o'clock tomorrow, in view of this fact, tomorrow, Tuesday, will be treated as victory in Europe then. This time they said the war was ending in Europe. They said, you're going to Japan. This is for the invasion of Japan. Now look on each side of you, and it was about the same number we had, and said, you, on each side of you, lucky, 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 if one of you come back. Okay, so. That, that was more harder training, I think. We got back to our tents about daybreak, got into our tents, and we, we were so dead tired because it had been almost 24 hours of training. And we barely got to sleep and the whistle started blowing, whistles and everything, you know, get up, get up, we said, oh my gosh, we're being attacked or something. Uh, we got uh, tension our, by our tent. We had, to, you know, you could imagine how we. <laughs> and they said, "You're not going anywhere. Japan just surrendered." The Japanese have accepted our terms fully. That's the word we've just received from the White House in Washington. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Second World War. Here's a funny thing. When I got out, I got on a train, went to Buffalo and you had your duffel bag, you could bring that home. Got on a bus in Jamestown, got off the bus at Lakewood where we lived on Marion Street, walked in and of course nobody knew I was coming, we didn't call and I was going, and I wasn't home 15 minutes and there was a knock on the door. And they opened it, there stood my old boss, Mr. Nelson, Minor Nelson, with a Nelson Pie Kitchen where I started working. He said, hello, Jack. I said, hello, Miner. How are you? He said, are you home for good now? 
I said, yes, I'm home for good. He said, good, be to work at six in the morning. <laughs> I said, Minor, I just got out of the Army for over three and a half years, over three years. He said, yeah, but I need you, be to work at six in the morning. I said, well, I guess when your boss tells you to be to work at six in the morning, you go to work at six in the morning, don't you? 